boxing is still pretty fun. Well, Red Steel was maybe a little bit of a disappointment also, but it was a launch title. It was just a pretty straightforward first-person shooter that happened to sometimes let you fight with a sword. And Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Smash Up, they just had this knack for making addictive, fun games. At this point, I should add the, the following to the overall concept. The prince can now run on walls. He can balance on beams. He can climb poles. He can swing on horizontal poles as well. He could in the third one as well, but the mechanics of it are much better. Also, and you probably already know this if you've heard anything of this trilogy, he can control time to an extent. Basically, he can rewind time so that if you accidentally fall into a bottomless pit, you can rewind time and try not to fall the next time. He can slow down time for a limited period of time. And this is a proper 3D The Prince of Persia game. You have to remember, when the 1989 game came out, that was the peak of what could be done where the 3D version is kind of just trying to live off that success. This one says, you know what, we can do new stuff, so let's. It's a great concept. The game is like the first one on speed. And again, do remember, I love the original from 1989. But games can be much faster today, and this is. I think in the course of the first game of this new trilogy, you fight as many enemies as in the first three Prince of Persia games put together, or just about, and there may now be more traps in a single place than in an entire game from the first trilogy. The traps no longer instantly kill you unless you get impaled on spikes in a pit, but they can assist in killing you. Say you're running across a wall and a saw blade I guess, nicks you because it really doesn't cut you in half, it'll, you know, make you fall into the pit you were trying to run over. And I don't know if it's Pit the Elder or Pit the Younger. You still climb up and down platforms on tiles, but it isn't the entire game anymore. Again, in 1989, that was what we could do. That was what the technology allowed. This stays true to the overall concept. You're still mainly just trying to make your way through these levels, dodging traps and maneuvering through these hostile environments which are not made for people to just waltz right through. Some of them have traps, some of them are desolate ruins. Essentially, only someone with the prince's unique physical abilities could really do it. The stories in this new trilogy are cool and properly explore the whole time travel aspect, and granted we also get all the common clues of the subgenre of time travel tales, but if you like time travel sci-fi, I definitely recommend these. Now without further ado, I give you Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, and no I don't know why it's in the middle when it's the first game of the new trilogy. A young and still nameless prince of Persia travels with his father, the Sultan, to the Maharaja of India and conquers his palace. It's a short struggle. The vizier has sabotaged the defenses, so there isn't much that the guards can do. As the prince, you are eager to find treasure to bring your father honor. What you find is the so-called Dagger of Time. Right after discovering it, you realize that it will allow you to rewind time. It's clear that the vizier wants the dagger, but the sultan won't let him have it. A moment later, the vizier is also told that he cannot have the large hourglass either. Thus he does to the sultan what he did to his former employer, the Maharaja. He betrays him. He tricks the prince into stabbing the dagger into the hourglass and turn it in the manner of a key. A girl around the prince's age, who we later find out the princess of India, 
tries to prevent it, but is unable to. The hourglass unleashes the sands of time, transforming everyone in the vicinity, except for the prince, the vizier, and Farah, into hideous sand monsters. The vizier tries to convince the prince to give him the dagger, but the prince instead runs away and now seeks to undo his mistake to return the sands to the hourglass. The graphics are excellent. This is an incredibly smooth engine, allowing detail, and the fact that most of the cutscenes are in-engine is not a bad thing because there is a great level of expression in these animated faces. For the first time since the original game, you are now locked in one location. Almost the entire game takes place in this one palace. I believe it belongs to an ally of the Sultan's, who he was trying to impress with the treasures. But there are of course a lot of areas in this palace. The kitchen, the baths, the prison, and these caves nearby. This is one of my favorite games of all time. It's a proper reboot of this franchise. I think it was originally supposed to be a prequel to the original trilogy, or at least the original 1989 game, but then this kind of took on a story and a life of its own, so they abandoned that. And I do like where they went with it, so that's kind of okay. We again have all this really cool maneuvering, running around, agility-driven puzzles. The tiles no longer fall out from underneath you, but there are some things that start to break once you move on to them, and you have to very quickly maneuver onto the next thing, which might also start to break. The concept is great and properly creates a new hostile environment for the prince, with only the one ally of Farah, who you'll occasionally accompany. She's armed with a bow and arrow, and she will occasionally hit you. In the original, it also made sense that there were no real allies, that you were on your own, because you were in this prison. Okay, so there aren't any other prisoners around, but we can suspend disbelief for that. Maybe it's one section of the prison. Maybe all the others were killed. Maybe he just hasn't had time to have the prince killed yet, or really doesn't believe that he can make it through all of that in one hour. In the second one, why doesn't the prince try to hide somewhere? I mean, think of how cool a twist it would have been if he had to suddenly work with beggars and thieves, who might be the only ones who'd want to sh provide shelter for him. Because maybe everybody thinks that he's no longer the prince. And in the third one, you're not in your father-in-law's sultandom, but still, why are there no people around who want to help you other than maybe one or two? But in this one, everybody, other than the one guard, early on, not entirely sure what happened there, is transformed. Not only that, everybody you have to fight used to be human beings, and not quote-unquote evil ones either. Well, and then a couple of crows, and I don't know what the larger of the birds are called. They also actually stay true to the fighting mechanics, on the whole. So fencing is still like an intense game of chess. If you go in just trying to wail on everybody, you will not win, at least not every fight, and you tend to be knocked back or knocked down, stunned for a couple of seconds if the enemies hit you, so you'll want to avoid that entirely. You don't really parry anymore, you kind of just block continuously. What I do like about the block is that it really does block. I mean, even if you're attacked by birds and you're blocking, their beak won't get you. And the enemies block happily also. So again, you can't just constantly attack. You almost invariably fight more than one enemy at a time here. But you move so fast and you can, within an instant, switch your focus from one enemy to another. You can jump back and forth between them and slash, you can vault over enemies other than the ones who won't let you because they'll knock you down with their weapon and attack them right after you. You can use one enemy to jump over another enemy and attack the second enemy as you land. 
you can use a wall to launch you towards enemies, you know, with the sword first.